What you know about layer one D5, greatest in the world, and they finally about to see why. What you know about XRD, I'm smart money, I ain't never on a decline. What you know about NFTs, it's not just Ace, when well, you finally gonna realize. You need scalability, need more utility, then you better call on these guys. I'm going radical, I'm going radish, I'm going radical, I'm going radish. I just be D5, never on a decline, building the future, I feel like a savage. Hello and welcome. I am Piers Ridiard, CEO of RDX Works, a core developer of the decentralized finance protocol Radix, a public ledger entirely focused on bringing DeFi into the mainstream. This is our podcast, The DeFi Download, a show about decentralized finance and all things crypto, where we dive into the details of the projects, assets and services that are powering the DeFi revolution. Today, I have Ramon Riquiero, co-founder and CEO of Kino, Kinto. Kinto is building the bridge between TradFi and DeFi and is looking to solve the issue of security in crypto with the first L2 that has KYC at the chain level. Ramon, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So let's start off with, you know, your background. I think you've got a really interesting background. You've done a bunch of stuff before uh, founding Kinto. So um, what, what brought you... What was the journey to creating Kinto and the first L2 that is focusing on bridging TradFi uh, to DeFi? Yeah, thank you. It was a long and painful journey. I mean, I'm a developer, so that's my background. But I moved into the US to study a master's degree many years ago. Um, I started working on games. I created my own game in a startup. Um, after that, I got acquired by Zynga and worked there for a few years, uh, you know, when Farmville, Wars with Friends, all those kind of games were really popular, and even your grandma <laughs> was playing those games. Um, and that was my first, probably, wake-up moment that uh, made me aware of why we need crypto. It's like when Facebook changed the the way the advertising revenue worked right. on, on the timeline and kind of tanked the, the business model of Singa overnight. And that was the first wake up moment, because if you don't control the platform where you're building the application, then it's not your platform, it's not your destiny. So you are at the whim of the of the base layer where you're building. Then after that, I I work in many companies in the Valley, including Google, where I led a technical team in Google Cloud. Then uh, then I also find my way into venture capital. I work on the other side at Y Combinator where I was already focused on crypto. Even now, I think if you check the, the blog of Y Combinator, the only articles about crypto are, are from me for, from that time. And during my time there, I, I saw companies like OpenSea or Dharma Protocol that was from that app that got acquired by OpenSea go through the, go through the program. Then uh, I couldn't think of anything else. And uh, I just needed to do crypto and YC uh, was a bit slow getting on the train, so I, I I joined Open Zeppelin. That was like the leading security firm. And they also created the ERC20. They also created the ERC721. So I joined as the head of product. And while I was there, I, I created the first. Um, with the team, we created the first approach to solve the UX issue on, on blockchain. That was the meta transaction network. That it was kind of a, the precursor of what is today known as account abstraction. Anyway, after being there for, for a while, one of the co-founders left and I, I left with him. And then I started working on DeFi uh, and I created an asset management protocol called Babylon Finance. The idea was simple. Uh, now with the tools of, of DeFi, it was really easy to create investment clubs. So you and your friends, when you are excited about an investment opportunity, you can pull money together into an investment contract and then deploy it. For example, you wanted to deposit man, money on Aave, then you wanted to borrow USDC and then put it on I don't know, on Carve and Convex and staking the, the LP tokens. You could do any, any, any strategy that was available on DeFi. And, and we integrated with more than 20 different protocols, including all the blue chips like Compound, Aave, Carve, Convex, Uniswap. And then we also integrated with Rari protocol. That Rari was a really fast growing protocol in the space that reached more than a billion uh, in deposits. And it was eventually acquired by the Fay Protocol team, another right. another protocol that uh, also disappeared after after this event. Um, so in in short, a few more, uh, everything was going great in, in Babylon. We got more than fifty million in deposits. Um, our token was tradable. We had on chain governance. We we released uh, a lot of nice. Um, tools to be able to use the platform, including gasless transactions. So you could you could just deposit 
without having to pay ETH for the transactions. Um, but then uh, Rari suffered a hack. And some of our investment class have invested their money in the Rari protocol, lending or borrowing. And then when this hack happened, then automatically Rari said, okay, we are gonna we are gonna refund the people, this is our problem, right. blah, blah, blah. And then <laughs> two weeks later, uh, through a governance proposal, they changed their mind and they said, no, right. we are not gonna refund now. So then we had to tell our users, oh, we told you that everything was fine, but now, uh, you know, of our 50 million, six millions are gone. So then in your money, what is said one dollar per, per share, now is 0 0.7. So then everyone else from ba that was a Babylon user, understandably, although it wasn't our fault directly, then we drew the money. And then at the same time, Terra was exploding, uh, SD was the pegging, so it was like <laughs> apocalypse. Uh, and yeah, we lost all, all of our deposits in a matter of uh, in a matter of a week or so. It was really quick in 10 days. So we went from 50 million in deposits to one, two. And a as a financial institution, I think it's, it's really hard to regain trust uh, no matter the reason, for example, at the beginning of the 1900s, it's really funny, very few people know this, but one of the ways that Chase became really big is because the founder was spreading stories or rumors about other banks being insolvent. And then no. the next day, they, they opened like really low and then he bought them. Uh, it, it's, 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 there are many books that, that on this mechanic. So, uh, it's, so in short, as a financial institution, if, if for whatever reason, if it's, if it's not your fault, you need to close or post deposits even for 10 minutes, you are done. So anyway, eventually, Rari changed their mind again three or four months later. So mm -hmm. we were able to refund our users as well, but the damage was done and it was right. gratuitous. It was really painful. So this was all a really traumatic experience, but it made me realize that people are not going to understand the, the benefits of crypto, you know, the 24-7, cheaper, uh, better access and permissionless if they are losing their money left and right. So first, it needs to be secure. First, it, it needs to be uh, safe for people to appreciate it. Um, so I know I just said a lot of things. But no, I think it's really interesting. So like what, through all of your various positions, like starting with, with gaming and then going to Zynga uh, and then sort of like um, Google Y Combinator, uh, and and on to open zeppelin like where did the where did the crypto infatuation start where did you start going now i want to spend more and more of my time getting into crypto and what was it that drew you in at that point yeah um one of the reasons why i chose the name babylon finance for my previous project was because of this book called the richest man in babylon that is one of the yes. the best books of personal finance so i became really interested in personal finance because you know i find it really unique also really sad in a way that, uh, you know, someone can be working all their life, uh, but then if on this computer screen, they decide to press a button or not at specific moments of their life, their wealth can be 10x or a 10th, depending on what they do. Doesn't matter, you know, they can be all their life working as a gardener, a baker, or, or, or in Wall Street, but then if they don't invest the money, so uh, knowing about investments and then knowing about what is money, what is wealth, going into that rabbit hole. Uh, and probably Bitcoin was a, a big a big part of that. Uh, it started me on that path. And that's why I was focused on wealth management and helping people create wealth. That's why I created Babylon. And then um, that aspect of, of crypto that is... I also live in Argentina for Open Zeppelin because that's another angle that you realize uh, that if an economy is, is suffering from 100% inflation, then it's really obvious that you're not going to trust the, the government currency and you need a place to store your wealth. That is something that people take for granted in the US or, or in Europe, but it becomes really obvious. So nobody there asks, oh, why do you need crypto? What's the use case? It's only used for criminals and terrorists. No, no, everybody uses it in Argentina. So <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Um, so yeah, it's a bit the money aspect, the development aspect of being able to own your platform and you are not the, at the whims of the Apple store that they can cancel you at any time or the Facebook store or the Google platform, being able to be free is the other, the other leg. Interesting. And so what made you then go from being like, crypto is important for me personally, I see the reason that it's important in the world to being like, I want to do something, I actually want to build in crypto. I, want, I feel like there's position, there's things that can be fixed that are broken that I can get involved in and, and, and do directly. Or there's product opportunities. It sounds like Babylon was more of a product opportunity. And then you experience the trauma of what happens when it goes wrong. 
But what was the yeah. what was the reason that you wanted to build ba- Babylon from so sort of open Zeppelin? You were now like, okay, now I want to build. I understand yeah. how smart contracts are made. Now I want to build. Yeah, I mean, a bit of that it was naivety, like you said, but a lot was also the opportunity, the gold rush. You see that this this opportunity is going to be one in, one in a lifetime, and I saw it a little bit while being really young, like the web, like when the web appeared and Google and still this new paradigm. And I secretly thought the same. It's a wealth create, creation opportunity of a lifetime. And it's like everything is going to change, but it's going to happen really slowly first. Uh, and then eventually all at once. And then I saw so much value. And even in DeFi, you know, it was, it was going through DeFi summer. Everything was, was like, uh, so much experimentation. And it's really cool because, you know, if you think about it in the last 2000 years, there probably have been like, I don't know, 200, 300 macro economies that have been able to twink, tinker with the with the knobs and handles. Oh, I increase interest rates, I increase that. Now, when you have your own DeFi protocol or you have your own platform, your own layer two, uh, it's something that you need to worry about and you can experiment with. You can uh, innovate uh, money and you can. So that that was really really appealing to me to be able to think from first principles how wealth and how money works and being able to experiment with it and iterate. So Babylon was like just that naivety that's wanting to share everything that is available on DeFi with as many people as possible. And then, of course, the, the downturn, the explosion comes, and then that also takes you down. But it's, it's the same that happens in, in the 2000s when there was a lot of a lot of promise from the web. And then the, the prices, the share prices of Pets.com got ahead of that reality. But then eventually, 10 years later, got realized by Airbnb, right. Uber, etc. So the same is going to happen here. But you just need more maturity. And that's where Kinto comes in. It's like security first, being able to play nicely with regulator while not compromising the, the ethos of decentralization. Because for TradFi or for banks so far, they had it pretty hard from their point of view because uh, they just care, oh, you're not going to make it. You're fun, have fun staying poor. There is no way for you to use it. And they, they see all the scams, all the hacks. They say, what the hell is this? It's the Wild West. And they have been pushed to these things that I think make no sense, that is private blockchains, where they have four or five people running the nodes and they're just exchanging money with each other. So velocity of money is zero. The developers are not there. The users are not there. So it makes no sense. It's the same like the intranets that some companies try to create in the internet era. So that's why right. I want to onboard as many people from TradFi today onto public networks. Got it. Okay. And so I think, you know, one of the aspects that I think is really interesting about Kinto is is you have built insurance directly into the system. And I'd actually like to start at that point. Obviously, the rare, the Rari hack and its impact on your your project, uh, Babylon Finance, has definitely less, left some scars, uh, along with all of the other things you talked about in terms of Lido uh, depegging and, uh, and yeah. the blow up of, of um, Luna. But like, how... How did you come to the idea that there needed to be like systemic insurance rather than, yep. you know, using Nexus Mutual or like it just being a DAP that, that, that's built on top of the platform using the, the half a dozen insurance related projects they're building up? And, and can you talk a little bit about how this insurance actually works and what kind of guarantees it's providing to the people who are using Kinto? Yep. Uh, that's a great question. And th- these systems are complementary. I mean, we'll probably also offer some kind of insurance per protocol, or there will be some insurance protocol that gets built on top of Kinto, or maybe Nexus Mutual decides to launch also on Kinto to offer these services. Um, but why we need some kind of systemic player to backstop everything? I mean, it goes back to how the monetary system even right now works. Even the Fed that's the original purpose of the Fed, you know, and when there are many as are when everything gets out of hand, when nobody can provide safe collateral, then that the Fed can act as the player of last resort to be able to backstop uh, in case of an emergency. So it's the same idea. In c- case there is a black swan, um, then we have this pool of, of funds that can assist the ecosystem in terms of necessity. Um, we are, so this, this, you, it's interesting yeah. you said the Fed rather than like FDIC because yeah. in some ways it feels more if you're if you're bailing out people individually 
like repaying individually, it feels more like FDIC insurance than than sort of like Federal Reserve backstop. I mean, I know they're related, but... Yeah, they are related, and the FDIC was created later. Originally, when the when the Fed was created, it was because of this and because of uh, there was a lot of private money also starting, and there was a lot of boom bust, and a lot of banks were failing. So that's why the Fed uh, appeared to create. The, then FDIC is a more modern inv- invention that in the end, you know, is either from the left pocket, the Fed or the Treasury, what goes to the FDIC. So. Um, and unfortunately, right now, the Treasury and the Fed tend to be more closely tied together. And then the FDIC comes from there, uh, that, like what happened to SVP last March. Um, so I forgot what was the, the question. So. Yeah, so, so it, was, it, was, it was a tangent. Don't worry. The, uh, the, the, I think the, the, the main point I'd like to understand is like, what are the guarantees that the, what are the things that the insurance is trying to cover? And what are the guarantees around that insurance? Yeah, uh, the way we have designed Quinto is to first cover the known unknowns, like for example, smart contract hacks, uh, because of having KYC at the chain level, that's gonna decrease by an order of magnitude, because for example, this RWA protocol only offers these assets to accredited investors in the US. In order to hack it, you will first need to steal identities, maybe a few to be able to even do the transaction to the hack, and then you need to escape the layer two to L1 before no, uh, everyone notices. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is the the rags or the link or the, or the scam links that uh, affect crypto on the rags. Uh, obviously, if to be able to deploy a protocol, to be able to deploy a token, we, you need to be KYC. That also decreases the chances. And then on the rags, on the on the scam links, if you have a smart contract wallet, all 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 these poor board ape holders that got their ape stolen through one of these links, uh, this won't happen because uh, the smart contract wallet is way safer. So after tackling the known unknowns, then uh, there are also unknown unknowns or black swans, like Nassim Taleb likes to call. And this can be anything from, I don't know, a critical provider or a call provider depending uh, for some asset, then some, some hack to some other part of the ecosystem, then even Arbitrum, that is going to be the, the tech we use to build the layer two, something happens there. Um, this this systemic insurance is built for that purpose. Interesting. Uh, and where's the money come from the insurance? How how's the insurance fund actually get funded? Yeah, uh, sequencer fees. Uh, a percentage of all of our sequencer fees is going to go there. So obviously it's going to grow with us as we grow. So at the beginning it's going to be limited. We're going to seed it with a part of the of the funds that we get from probably our, our next run, but then uh, it will grow as we grow with the fees. Got it. Okay. So let's let's start at the top now. You guys are an L2 on top of Ethereum. Yep. Or you're going to be an L2 on top of Ethereum. You guys are already in launch, uh, have a launch program ongoing, and you're expecting the the network itself to be launching in Q1 next year. Yep. So, um, but your L2 is a little bit different from other L2s in that you have KYC on chain. So what does that actually mean? Like KYC on chain, what do I have to, what do I have to do KYC for to be able to do on top of the, uh, on, on top of Kinto? Yeah. Great question. The, f- the first thing to clarify there is that Kinto doesn't store any PII, doesn't store any personal data. We don't have any data and we don't even control if people can use the chain. So it's still permissionless. Then uh, we have this KYC that we call permissionless KYC or user on KYC. Where users uh, first at yeah, the governance level will be able to create the list of KYC providers that we uh, offer to users to jump on board. And the user, the first time they join Kinto or they want to use an application on Kinto, they will have to create the wallet. And, and first, in the first step, they need to KYC. And they will see a list of providers, uh, providers like Plaid, like Synapse, like Persona, providers that you are used to in the web too, that are really good at doing what they do. And then uh, they complete the KYC process. They keep the PII themselves. And Kinto, uh, when when the KYC is completed, will mint you an NFT. And it's also important to mention that the KYC providers don't have your, your on-chain address. So even if the KYC providers get hacked, they cannot link your, your PII to your account. Then, um, for example, if you visit an RWA protocol, and this happens right now on Ethereum, and that's why part of the reason why RWA protocols haven't grown that much is you go to Centrifuge, you go to Trufa, you go to Goldfinch, uh, you need to uh, do a different KYC process for each one of them. Mm-hmm. And, and then some of them may also ask for your data uh, and then you need to give it to them. Uh, thing, 
Kinto is the approach of creating a network effect, the same way the Apple Store, that you just put your credit card one, and then with a tap, you can you can enter everywhere. Here's the same you can see once. And then if Centrifuge also wants to ask you for for your date of birth, for example, because they need it for whatever special regulation they have, uh, they will say, hey, Piers, uh, this is the first time you're joining Centrifuge. Uh, we also need your your date of birth. You want to give it to us. You want to give it to us and you will have like a Facebook pop up of permissions and you will be able to sign and give them this signature that then they can use to call one of our nodes to fetch the the data from whatever KYC provider you use. Mm -hmm. uh, but then mm -hmm. Kinto, again, Kinto, this doesn't go through Kinto, it doesn't go through anyone, and the user is always in charge of their privacy uh, and their data. I, and, and from the point of view of, like, why gate it at the at the ledger level? Why gate it at the yeah. chain level? If, if, you know, what you're describing here, you could build at the application layer. You just say, okay, that you know, there's a, there's a bunch of KYC providers you can... If you need to use any of these applications, you can KYC, but there's also these applications here that you don't have to KYC for if you want to, you know, have some fun and play around as well. Yeah, great question. And the answer is nuanced, but I think it's, it's, really, it's really important to understand that uh, the mental model is totally different of solving something, you see, for example, as a protocol inside of Ethereum, than solving it as the chain. If you solve it as the chain level, composability becomes much easier because you know that everyone inside has been KYC'd. Uh, also, institutions, for them, it's actually quite obvious that you need to do this at the chain level because say, oh, everyone is KYC, everyone is checking the AML regulation, and this is why they have been achieving this through private blockchains. That makes no sense for different reasons. So, But once you have this ecosystem, once you are inside, you know you are safe from the Wild West. You know nobody can dust you from Tornado Cast because even liquid on-chain funds sometimes don't deploy capital on Aave, or, or curve because they don't know who else is doing stuff there. So that will violate their counterparty requirements. They need to know. And this is something that in Quinto, uh, institutions will feel much more confident deploying capital. And then uh, the composability between different RWE assets becomes much easier because you know, you can check on chain. It's like, oh, this asset is only for people that are in France, Spain, and the US. And you can compose it with other assets that are in the same universe. Okay. So uh, from the point of view of um, institutional adoption, like wh what's your, what's, wh where do you see your wedge here being? Like what's your first sort of go-to-market applications you see as being most easily knocked downable for this kind of uh, value proposition? Yeah, we have talked with a lot of big financial institutions, you know, like Franklin Templeton, uh, BlackRock, Etc. cetera, uh, Skybridge, uh, almost all the players based in New York. And the difference from two or three years ago is they're actually now building and seriously uh, experimenting with Kinto. Franklin Templeton, for example, deployed the Benji token on Stellar. So now the reception is, is really good. Uh, these institutions are going to be, it's still a long cycle, so it's going to take them months to years. So for now, what we are focusing on is RWA protocols, RWA protocols that are crypto native, but they are creating assets that are more appealing to traditional investors like family offices or, or funds. Uh, and these RWA protocols, they need some KYC requirements, they need some compliance requirements, and they lack that composability right now in, in mainnet, and they lack that easy access to institutional capital. So we are partnering with uh, protocols like Centrifuge, TrueFi, uh, Bact, etc. So your your first applications are going to be real world assets, and um, what do you hope? So a lot of the a lot of the problems as you've identified here around real world assets are often sort of secondary market liquidity of these assets, uh, and yeah. the the issue often isn't just that KYC AML has to be there. It's also that you have a bunch of regulations around enablement of 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 securities uh in in secondary markets in the first place so like how do you see that getting solved yeah it's a long tail of assets and honestly uh you know some of them like putting this building on chain and call it a real world asset uh, that's not something that we're interested in to start because it doesn't scale for example the the first killer asset right now that is really obvious is just offering treasuries on chain and being yes. able to let you use as collateral so you can loop it so that's going to be yeah. like our, our killer asset for for launch uh, 
uh, and there is a lot of demand because the, the interest rates are really high and, and it's like the risk-free rate of the world. So that's where we are starting. Okay, and then how, how does that how, how does that then get, have more functionality than what you already see on Ethereum and sort of multiple other ledgers where people are bringing sort of real uh, treasury tokenized treasury bills on Ledger, right? I, I can't remember what the the biggest one of that is, but I know there's like on three the, or four that on have, the there are a few of them. The, the, the thing is on the, the, uh, Maple Finance, a couple of others. So like what what does Kinto offer here that, that that differentiates itself from the existing providers that are on other ledgers? Being able to use it as collateral is, is a big one. And then also being able to uh, tell the institutions that here on Kinto they have this extra level of security, they can meet their their compliance requirements. Uh, it becomes key also to to attract that extra capital. And then also you can see that the uh, return profile of Kinto, when you, of, for example, you can loop this collateral, this treasury bill, put them as collateral, borrow from it, and then buy more treasuries on top of it or buy something else. And then if there are some mining program, mining incentives, eventually Kinto releases some of these programs, then the return profile pair with the security guarantees that Kinto offers uh, can become quite compelling for some of these on-chain deployers. So th th this is sort of like supply side stuff. Um, where do you see the demand side coming from? Who's going to be bringing the capital? Who's going to be bringing the fast capital onto Kinto? Um, the cool thing, one of our investors is the Sol Network. and They have a connection of, uh, they have a network of hundreds of family funds, family offices, um, and we are talking with them and uh, we are partnering also with some traditional funds like Skybridge is also one of our launch partners and uh, they are going to bring the initial capital but we're also targeting the segment of crypto crypto users because on Kinto we don't want to redeploy you know the USDC ETH pool we don't want to redeploy Aave Uniswap or just like most of all the other users are, are doing that they are basically the same we want on Kinto have assets that you don't have anywhere else and you have options that you don't have anywhere else so we're still targeting uh, um, the crypto DGN users. Like, you know, you could see that they can they can invest up to a billion dollars in Blast in, in a matter of two weeks. So there is still a lot of capital floating around. And because we have account abstraction, because we the user is not going to have to worry about uh, seed, seed phrases or MetaMask or gas, then we hope we can onboard also the next wave. People that have used Coinbase, for example, but have never touched any any extension we hope to also onboard them because they can just use uh, the ui that they are used to okay um and uh you've also got sort of built into the platform which i think is really interesting we're, we're a huge advocate of, of of account abstraction or smart accounts um you've also got account abstraction built natively into the chain could you talk a little bit about how that differs from um, account abstraction in Ethereum, what like natively built in account abstraction means for your L2? Yeah, we're still compatible with the EIP of Ethereum. That is the same one that everyone is using in Arbitrum. The, the main difference here is that in, in Kinto, we have disabled EOAs. So you cannot use uh, a plain MetaMask account. So you are forced yep. to use, uh, uh, that is something like a Starknet, for example, also has, that mm -hmm. you are forced yep. to use an account abstracted wallet. Uh, and that basically removes all the a lot of scams that are possible right now on, on other chains. They are not going to be possible on. And, and the way we are thinking about it is our wallet will have different signers. Some of them maybe just your email passkey through through Turnkey. Some of them maybe connecting your hardware wallet. And some of them, if you require higher level of security, is going to be fireblocks or institutional providers. Really interesting. And, and what do you hope to achieve? Like. Uh, outside of all of the scams and exploits and stuff like that, do you see um, uh, w what kind of uh, institutional adoption do you think becomes possible with account abstraction being a, a sort of a key feature of the of the ledger? Yeah, in, in general, in crypto, I think many people, um, maybe me included, a few years ago, they want decentralization at the expense of every everyone else, everything else, and I think they are right. You know, I think ten years from now, or hopefully earlier, I think. There is no reason for governments to see my whole ID or see my whole data. If I can prove that I, I'm a citizen of the US, I'm a citizen of California, they have no reason to, to see anything beyond that if I can prove it. But unfortunately, these institutions and many big financial companies, they have a lot of onerous requirements that they need to meet 
today. So if we want to create value today, and in the end, that's what we are here, uh, that's why we're providing this bridge through this KYC uh, solution. But then as the regulation becomes more used to zero knowledge proofs, we're going to replace uh, this system with zero knowledge proofs because they don't need it. So, and I hope uh, as soon as possible, we can get rid of it. Uh, but right now, basically we want the compliance guy of a uh, of compliance department of every financial institution to see, oh, actually Quinto checks my boxes. So if we want to do something, we, we can build it there. So I'm I'm going to take a, a sort of like um, a slightly adversarial position here. This is not necessarily what I believe. It's just I think there's some interesting things to tease out. So if you if if to do anything on top of uh, the Kinto Ledger, I require KYC. Um, are you not just creating a permission network in a, in another form? Um, and what I mean by that is uh, when you think of well, when I think of a base layer. And I, I think of something like the internet. I think of something which fundamentally has no barriers to entry in which people can interact with it, can use it. Um, and while, you know, Plaid and people like that may be able to service North America very well, um, you're essentially excluding large parts of the world. Uh, and you are making this into a system that that is very similar to the system that we already have with with banks and with um, and and looking to replicate the functionality that we have there but as a result of looking to replicate the functionality by gating the ability to use it in the first place it is essentially um removing the point of having the digital commons in the first place the 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 underpinning philosophy of having the digital commons in the first place yeah that's a great question and thank you for bringing it up first of all uh, to mention that this is optional and we definitely don't want to have to uh, require you to go through this in order to buy any digital assets, you know, like Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, or all the assets that are already available. Then on Quinto, we just want to give you access, optionally, if you want to, to things that right now require this process, like, for example, being able to buy a mortgage or being able to use maybe your crypto as collateral to buy a mortgage. If you want to do that, that's a really good use case that you cannot do right now with crypto, but you, 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 you are going to be able to do it on Quinto. And then regarding the the permission aspect, it's still permission because, I mean, we have right now three KYC providers. We'll add more and we support now, now 82 countries. And by launch, we're going to support like 120 countries and we'll eventually cover everything. Um, you as a an user, because Quinto, Quinto doesn't control whether you get access or not. You have a few KYC providers to choose, and as a an user through governance, you will be able, users will also be able to control which KYC providers are even available. And then as long as a user picks any one of them, then uh, you are in and you can transact. It's more akin to a citizenship in a country or when you enter a theme park that, yes, you need to abide to the rule to get in, to enter. But once you are in, everything, everything is available to you. And it's an optional thing. It's not like everyone needs to go to the theme park. Uh, there are many people that don't like theme parks and they need to go there. And in this case, you know, Ethereum and the, to buy NFTs, you definitely shouldn't need to, to go through this theme park or through buy Bitcoin, through buy Ethereum, to, through, to buy STE. You don't need to go here, but if you need to buy some of these assets that are required for whatever reason and whether you like it or not, uh, then it's better to have access to it through Quinto because another problem right now, if, if someone is, has some capital in, in the traditional market and has some capital in crypto, to move capital from one to another, it takes you three, four, five days. You need to go to Coinbase, then send the bank, then from there go to the, your brokerage. Uh, being able to have all that unified is going to provide a lot of value because it's going to reduce the friction, reduce the cost, and increase, increase the availability. And I think tying everything to a permissionless layer that is Ethereum, and we are, connect, we are doing all this work on Ethereum to be able to connect all this pipe to Ethereum and eventually enrich the Ethereum ecosystem. I think that's where the value, I mean, it's a nuance point, but I think it's, I think it's, it's important. Interesting. So from the point of view of, um, you're, you're, you're essentially, your business proposition here is saying there is a subsection of the market that's very large. There is a, there's a, there's an addressable market here. It's currently difficult to address on top of um, a entirely permissionless ledger. Uh, and so we are going to build a permissioned layer two, like, you know, broadly speaking, 
um, that allows more institutional capital to come on top of public ledgers so that they yep. can have guarantee, the guarantees that they need to be able to assure that, that that capital isn't going to be dealing with a counterparty that they don't want to deal with. Um, that does interest. I open up an interesting point because like a, a lot of the experience I've had with AML from a implementation point of view rather than from a user point of view is that the requirements end up being multifaceted and very nuanced based on each institution's own view. So, view. so like each institution has their own specific like if money laundering happen if they if they interact with money laundering they're on the hook it doesn't matter whether or not they did the KYC AML or someone else did it's their liability because you can't delegate the responsibility for uh, anti money laundering you can you can delegate the um, the actual act of it but you're still on the hook for it like it doesn't it, something goes wrong it's your your fault and you know if you're opening up to hundreds of countries or 120 countries you now start to get into not quite OFAC list, list territory but you start to get into more marginal jurisdictions where there will be like Franklin Templeton and people like that who will just be like we can't deal with anyone from those jurisdictions we need a narrower guarantee we need to know that our counterparties are actually only from these jurisdictions and so like do you see the likelihood being that any applications that come along, so someone builds an Aave equivalent or a Uniswap equivalent or, you know, whatever, where I'm going to be dealing against multiple counterparties uh, rather than a one-to-one -one relationship where your, your system is going to need to be able to do, like, is going to need more information. Like, so the gating of actually getting into that system is going to be more than just, do I have an NFT that, that tells you me that I have you know, past KYC AML. Great. Not enough information. You want to get in here, I need more. Um, and so either the KYC AML system that is being provided by the standard parties has to be a lot more deep. Like, where's source of wealth, source of funds coming? Is that being done on there? Like, is it sufficient source of wealth, source of funds for that particular institution uh, for their counterparty requirements versus another? Like, how do you deal with all of this nuance? Yeah, great question. First of all, um, saying that uh, users go through this process first and then they are in, but then, for example, you're Frank in Templeton, and for this asset, you only require, you, you only accept US accredited investors. You code that into your project. So every developer codes their, their project, their asset to serve only the jurisdictions that they apply. Then, as you mentioned, Franklin Templeton, they need to get the, the data themselves. So from the user's point of view, they first do the generic KYC when they come in. And then when they visit uh, Franklin Templeton, Franklin Templeton will ask them, hey, I also need this, this, and this for this reason. And then for the user, it's still a better experience because they can pre-fill or refill or reuse whatever they have. And then just add this new like accreditation or stamps that are specific to Franklin Templeton or for whoever else. Yeah, I, I suppose, you know, sort of the the guarantees about counterparties is, is sort of the thing that I'm getting at here. Like the, the, the buying of assets I get, I go to Franklin Templeton. I won, I don't know, like some fund that fact Franklin Templeton offers and now they're offering a tokenized version of it. Cool. I need to represent to them the, um, the proofs plus extra information. Yeah. Now I've got that fund. I want to be able to use that as collateral. So what market can I use that on as collateral? And how does that market allow the people who are interacting with that market reason about their counterparties in a way that has some guarantees that fit? Like, are you servicing the lowest common denominator? Are you being very strict? Like, or how are the marketplaces thinking about reasoning this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have on the on the source of funds and stuff, we're going to work with chain analysis. We're going to have that running uh, on the chain, uh, mostly on the bridges in and out of the chain uh, to make sure uh, everything is as, as compliant as possible. But then uh, regarding the counterpart, you're right that, um, for example, Franklin Templeton offers this bill, let's say, the bill-like product, and it's only available to, you, to US accredited. Then uh, this 
lending protocol has this universe of assets that are only available to US accredited. And that's where you can have the composability, but you cannot have composability with the other stuff. So it's, it's separated by universes, if that makes sense. And, it, and obviously, if someone, if something is open to everyone, you can compose that with everything. But as you said, it's kind of like the, the Venn diagram and you need to pick like the part that overlap. Interesting. Really interesting. So, so the, I suppose the, the bet here is, is, is at base that getting the activation energy early. So you, you have a higher friction to get people in. But if you can get enough people in, then the lower friction that results within your ecosystem as a result of that um, is going to be uh, better um, overall. Uh, Follow-up question. If you're giving people NFTs and proofs on your chain, uh, can other people can can I use those NFTs and proofs on other chains? Yes, you could. And for example, one use case that some other people have already asked us because we are doing right now our launch program and our technology is, is really good to also do a really compelling airdrop. And you could even use just use Kinto if you want to do an airdrop where you are sure that every person is their own unique people yep. and you know you don't have all these farming bots. So that's already a compelling use case and you could just use it use the technology uh, to create your airdrop and then deploy on whatever chain you want. Really interesting. Really interesting. I mean, it's a fascinating approach. Um, I think there's a sort of a, a few projects that have done things like this before. Um, one of which is a sort of poly chain from polymath. Like they, they, they sort of tried to do this, but their own ledger. I think the unique thing here is that this is able to riff on the fact that the, you can move your assets so easily from Ethereum to this L to this L two, exactly. and you have that established Ethereum sort of ecosystem there. Um, and and I'm going to be watching it with sort of real interest because I think that it's. Um, I agree with you. I think that the institutional capital play is a huge latent play in crypto, uh, and I, I really, really, um, I'm really uh, sort of like rooting for you guys to be the first place that actually makes sure that this happens uh, and 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 gets this sort of next wave of capital which is huge uh onto chain and actually playing in the decentralized ecosystems that that are going to is where finance is ultimately going to be built thank you i really appreciate it yeah and this is the the way i communicated to people in crypto this is a this is a pie that is getting bigger, you know, it's not Kinto, it's not, right. it doesn't want to fragment any liquidity from Arbitrum or Mainnet. We want to add more use cases and want to add more things on top. Yeah, it's awesome. Ramon, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, real pleasure having you. Just, just finally, how do people get involved? What do you want people to do right now? Thank you. Here, you head to Kinto.xyz and you can join our launch program. We already uh, open a few thousand spots to, uh, for users so they can go through the KYC process. We already have filled more than a thousand. And if you want to follow us on Twitter at Quinto XYC, and you can follow me as my full name on Twitter as well. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show and looking forward to speaking again soon. Thanks a lot. It was a treat. Thank you. You better call on these guys. I'm going radical. 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 I'm going radical